page 13, chapter 5, All Aboard. Miss Meek stands at the head of the class and for the and for the 31st and last time gives her famous opening day speech. Good morning, young citizens. It pleases her to think that many years down the road, a student or two might recall that Miss Meeks called them young citizens in the first grade. She feels that America's children are babied a bit too much and way too long. Welcome to your first day at John W. Satterfield Elementary School. This is a big, big day for you. Not only is it the first day of the school year, it is the first day of 12 school years. Hopefully, 12 years from now, every one of you will graduate from high school. That sounds like forever from now, doesn't it? A sea of nodding heads, as always. But it will come. Twelve years from now will surely come, and you will have learned how to write a topic sentence, and how to solve an equation, and even how to spell the word. She pauses dramatically. She opens her eyes wide as if seeing the wonderful future. Tin, tinabulation. Audible gasps come from the sea of wide-eyed, oh-mouth faces. A few shake their heads in vigorous denial. She sneaks a peek at Donald Zinkoff. He alone is grinning, giggling actually, as if he had been tickled. By the time you graduate from high school, many of you will already be driving cars and holding jobs. You will be ready to take your places in the world. You will be ready to travel all the way across the country by yourself, if you wish, or to another country. You will be ready to begin your own families. What a wonderful adventure it will be. And it all begins here, right now, today. It will be a journey and an adventure of many days. She pauses. She holds out her arms. How many days, you ask? Several hands shoot up. She knows if she answers them, someone will knock her whole point out of whack with a guess in the millions. She ignores them. She goes to the board. With a new year, crisply cut length of chalk, she writes in large numbers on the green slate. 180. That, she says is the number of days we are required to be in school each year. She turns back to the green board. Under the, the 180, she writes, times 12. That is the number of years you will attend school. Now, let's multiply. She does the math on the green board, writing the number slowly, grandly. 180 times 12. 360 plus 180 equals 2,160. She points to the bottom number. There it is. She taps the green board twice with the chalk. 2,160. The days of your journey. That is how long your adventure will last. Every one of those days will be an opportunity to learn something new. Just imagine how much you can learn in 2,160 days. She pauses to let them imagine. 2,160 adventures, 2,160 opportunities to become whatever you want to become. This is what you've been waiting six years for. This is the day it begins. She wishes she had a camera. She looks at the clock above the door. She acts surprised. Oh my goodness, look at that. Time is passing. Before you know it, there will, be o there will only be 2,159 days left. Our first day is passing by, and we haven't even learned a thing yet. What do you say we get this learning train started? 
she reaches into her desk drawer and pulls out the old navy blue train conductor's cap. For the 31st and last time, she puts it on. She pumps her hand twice. Toot, toot, all aboard the learning train. First stop, writing my own name. Who's coming aboard? 26 hands shoot into the air and Zinkoff, jumping to his feet so fast that he knocks his desk over with a nerve-slapping racket, thrusts his hands, thrusts up his hands and bellows to the ceiling, Yahoo! Chapter 6, page 18, A Wonderful Question. Donald Zinkoff. Before arriving in first grade, he has learned his letters, some of them anyway. And of course, he has seen his name from time to time. But he has never traced it on see-through paper. He has never tried to copy it, has never hitched a ride at a pencil point, feeling the shape and movement of his name's letters. D-O-N. Now, as he moves the pencil across the blue lines of the paper, he feels a thrill. He stares at his name and it is as if he is staring at himself, as if the Donald Zinkoff that was born six years ago is here and now, by his own hand, in some small way, being born all over again. He rushes up to the teacher. He shoves the paper in her face. Look, it's me! She takes the paper. At the top is his name, as she has spelled it out for him to copy, as she has done for all of the students. Below that is his own attempt. If she didn't know what it was supposed to say, she could never read it. The confusion of pencil lines on the paper makes no more sense than the playpen doodlings of a two-year-old. The joy streaming up from his face makes her smile. She lays a hand on his shoulder. To be perfectly precise about it, she says. It is not you. It is your name. Your name is very important. It, re it represents you. What does represents mean, he says. That means it takes your place. It sort of substitutes for you. Even when you yourself are not in a particular place, your name can be there. And so it's important to write it properly. She hands the paper back to him. And to write it properly, you must practice. Use both sides. A hundred sides would not have made a difference. Collecting papers before recess, she discovers that she still cannot read Donald Zinkoff's name. Of itself, this is no big deal. He certainly isn't the first sloppy handwriter she has come across. In the past, she has had straight A students who could not seem to write a legible word. On the other hand, Sometimes poor penmanship indicates a problem with motor skills. For the boy's sake, she hopes he is simply sloppy. Recess. At exactly 10 o'clock a.m., or excuse me, at exactly 10 a.m., Zinkoff bursts onto the playground with the other Satterfield first, second, and third graders. For the first minute, he is disappointed. He expected recess to be something different, something new. It turns out to be simply free time. Recess turns out to be just another name for life as he has always known it. Only shorter. His first recess lasted six years. This one is 15 minutes. He means to make the most of it. He dashes back into the school. No one stops him. No one sees him. No one has ever run back into school during recess. He pulls his giraffe hat from the cubby and runs back out to the playground. Hey, there he is, someone shouts. The kid with the hat. In seconds, there's a crowd around him. Kids reaching up to touch the hat. Kids calling, can I wear it? And then the hat is gone, snatched from his head. A boy has it. He's running off with it, jamming it onto his own head. Now other hands are reaching, grabbing, snatching. The hat goes from head to head. The kids are screaming, laughing. A second grader runs off with it. He goes galloping around the playground. The brown and yellow hat bobs on his head like a real giraffe. 
Zinkoff laughs aloud. He enjoys the spectacle so much that he forgets the hat is his. And then a tall, red-haired boy, a fourth grader, stands in front of the galloper, holding out his hand. The second grader takes off the hat and hands it over. The red-haired fourth grader looks at the hat carefully. Instead of putting it on his head, he sticks his arm into it, all the way up to his shoulder. With his fingers inside the hat, he makes a giraffe nod and seem to talk. He walks over to one of his equally tall friends. He makes the giraffe's mouth clamp onto his friend's nose. Everybody laughs. Zinkoff laughs. Even the recess duty teacher laughs. The boy turns to the first graders who are keeping their distance. Whose hat is this? Zinkoff runs forward. He trips over a foot and falls flat on his face. Everybody laughs. Zinkoff laughs. He comes up to the tall, red-haired boy. He stands much closer than a first grader normally gets to a fourth grader. He looks directly up into the tall boy's face and proudly announces, It's my hat. The boy smiles. He shakes his head slowly. It's my hat. Zinkoff just stares up. He is fascinated by the boy's face. He has never seen a face smile and shake itself. No, at the same time. And he realizes that apparently there has been a mistake. Perhaps the tall boy was at the zoo on the same day Zinkoff was there. Perhaps he bought the giraffe hat first and left it behind by mistake. Whatever, there is no mistaking what the boy said. It's my hat. Zinkoff is sad. He has really come to love the hat that he thought was his. But he is not sad, too, because he can tell how happy it makes the tall boy to get his hat back. The boy is still smiling down at him. Zinkoff already knows that smiles do not like to be alone, so he sends his best smile up to join the one above. Okay, he says cheerfully. The smile on the tall boy's face twists and changes. Zinkoff does not know it, but he has just cheated the boy. The boy expected Zinkoff to make a fuss, to try to get his hat back, maybe even to cry or pitch a fit. The boy loves to see first graders pitch fits. It's fun. And now he is cheated of his fun, cheated by the smiling, agreeable little insect in front of him. The tall boy takes off the hat. He pokes Zinkoff in the forehead with one of the giraffe's horns. It's not mine, you dummy. He wags his head and snickers. He turns to his friends. First graders are so dumb. His friends laugh. He throws the hat to the ground. As he walks off, he makes sure to step on it. Zinkoff picks up the hat. Pieces of grit cling to the fuzzy surface. Suddenly, the tall boy turns and looks back. Zinkoff drops the hat in case the boy wishes to step on it again. But the boy only laughs and goes away. Zinkoff's mother is waiting for him after school. All the way home, he jabbers about his incredible first day. Do you like your teacher? She asks him. I love my teacher, he says. She called us young citizens. She pats the top of his hat, which makes him almost as tall as her. One thousand congratulations to you. He beams. Do I get a star? I believe you do. His mother always carries with her a plastic baggie of silver stars. She takes one out, licks it, and presses it onto his shirt. There. As he bows his head to look at the star, the hat topples from his head. His mother picks it up. She puts it on her own head. Zinkoff howls and claps. She wears it the rest of the way home. Later, Zinkoff sits on the front step, waiting for his father to come home from work. His father is a mailman. He walks all day on his job, but drives to and from the post office in his clunker. The Zinkoffs cannot afford a new car, so Mr. Zinkoff buys used ones. Every time he buys one, he gets excited. She's a real honey bug, he says. And then, a month or two later, every time, the honey bug starts to go bad. A retread tire loses its rubber. The carburetor starts coughing. The belts break. He keeps patching it up with duct tape, bailing wire, and chewing gum. 
Pretty soon, everything is patches except Mr. Z's faith in his honey bug. The day always comes when Mrs. Z whispers to her son, It's another clunker. Zinkoff giggles and nods, but he never says the word clunker to his father, as that might hurt his feelings. It is never long after Mrs. Z says clunker that the car usually that the car dies, usually on a rainy morning on the way to work. The car simply refuses to move another inch over the face of this earth, and even Mr. Z knows that it is beyond the help of even a thousand new plugs of chewing gum. The next day he gets rid of it and begins shopping for a new honey bug. This cycle has happened four times so far which is why Zinkoff, mother and son, between the two of them, call the current car Clunker 4. Zinkoff hears Clunker 4 long before he sees it. It makes a high squeal that reminds him of elephants in the movies. He runs to the curb as the car rounds the corner and rattles to a stop. As usual, there is a smell of something burning in the air. Daddy, he cries out, jumping, to his, jumping into his father's arms. I went to school. And a star to prove it, says his father, hoisting him into the house. Zinkoff talks about his first day at the dinner table, and after dinner, and right up until bedtime. As always, the last thing his mother says to him at night is, Say your prayers. While she hides his giraffe hat in the trunk with the comforters and fancy tablecloth, Zinkoff transfers a star from his school shirt to his pajamas. He climbs into bed and tells God all about his first day. Then he tells the stars. At this time in his life, Zinkoff sees no difference between the stars in the sky and the stars in his mother's plastic baggie. He believes that stars fall from the sky sometimes and that his mother goes around collecting them like acorns. He believes she has to use heavy gloves and dark sunglasses because the fallen stars are so hot and shiny. She puts them in the freezer for 45 minutes, and when they come out, they are flat and silver and sticky on the back and ready for his shirts. This makes him feel close to the unfallen stars left in the sky. He thinks of them as his nightlights. As he grows drowsy in bed, he wonders which is greater, the number of stars in the sky or the number of school days left in his life. It's a wonderful question.